So today I will share with you few stories of people who made an impact of their lives. They are not great educated people, neither are they great wealthy people. I choose particularly these stories to impress you that God can use any simple humble being if you are willing to understand why you are here and make use of that purpose for which God has created you. How many of you have heard of this man called William Carey? Theological students must have heard. He is a Britisher. When he was 14 years old, when he was 7, 8 years old, he was a very poor boy. He has to work to support himself. By the age of 12, he was working in a cobbler shop in London to helping make shoes and whatever the money he gets, he would support himself. But he had a great passion to preach. So he would go around the streets of London preaching and meantime and, and the rest of the time he would do his uh, work in the cobbler shop. And as the time went by, by the age of 14, he would also go to libraries. He learned Greek, he learned Hebrew, all by self-taught. Nowadays, you struggle even to learn alphabets properly, isn't it? But all self-taught, he went to the libraries, he would read. He could read and write seven languages, all self-taught. Because he had a passion to learn the Bible in original language, to teach Bible to people. 14-year-old boy. And then he would go on the streets of London preaching and talking to people. By doing that, he was neglecting his work in the shop. One day his business, his manager calls him and says, William, this is not acceptable. You are neglecting your business. If this is what you do, how would you earn money to support yourself? You know what he said? This is him in the shop. When the manager said, you're neglecting your business, this is his famous statement. He said, neglecting my business? My business is to extend the kingdom of God. I only cobble shoes to pay my expenses. What a powerful thought. For him, money is not an issue. I need little money so that I could feed my stomach. But beyond that, my business is to extend the kingdom of God. How I wish some of us can catch this sentence into our lives. Even as me as pastors, we are worried about money. Where does it come from? I have less salary. I have this to take care. I have that to take care. I have that place, this. We are so much worried about what we want here, not the kingdom of God. But in prayer and preaching, we all speak of kingdom of God. God have mercy on us. This boy, 14-year-old, full of aspiration, he could have, but he says, my business is to extend the kingdom of God. And then in his shop, in his shop, he had a map, world map. He would place his hand on the world map and he would pray. His hand would go on India. And the more he prayed, the more passion he developed to go to India as a missionary. But he's not educated, he's not qualified. The London Society of Missions he went and approached, can you send me as a missionary? They said, what's your qualification? What do you do? No qualification. They rejected him time and again, but he never gave up. He always would open the shop. The first thing he would do is place his hand on the Indian map and say, Lord, I want to go to this nation and be a missionary. No job, no education, no money, no support, no influence, and yet had a passion to serve. Finally, the London Society Mission said, you know what, we can't send you as a missionary because he was pestering them. But there's a mission, missionary family we're sending to India. You could go as a helper. He said, I, I, I don't mind, I will go. So he went as a helper. He landed in India, in Calcutta. And he started what he could. Whatever the knowledge he acquired here by self-study and other things, he transformed in the field of printing, in the field of agriculture, and one of his most contribution to India he was what? <clears throat> he translated Bible into so many languages. Not that he himself did it. He employed people. He oversaw. If there is Bible in Indian vernacular languages today, it's because of William Kerr. He helped farmers how to do proper farming. He was the one who introduced printing presses in India. Christianity spread in India like a wildfire because of William Carey. An uneducated boy simply had a passion. If you come to India today, among all Christians, 
he is one of the toppest heroes of faith. It's because of him I could read Bible in my own language. He discovered the purpose of his life is to extend the kingdom of God, not earn money, build a house, buy a car, go on a tour. That's what he felt the purpose. In fact, on Indian stamp, you know stamps? His photo, can you imagine? A foreigner's photo on an Indian stamp. Those days, that's how valuable he was to the Indian society. This is a Father Jerome, a Roman priest. You might have heard of him. Theology students, you would have heard of him. <clears throat> In 382 AD, he was, he, he was pastoring a huge church, very big church those days. The people loved him. He was the most humble, lovable, loving pastor. Every day he was going through the emotions of ministry, ministering to people, praying and all sorts of things. But at that time, one of the lack in the Christianity was not many Bibles. Bibles were not there. So somebody was in, asked him if he could translate. I think it was Pope who asked him if he could translate the Bible. How could he leave such a lucrative job of being a pastor of one of the biggest churches, well loved, and he, you know, to go somewhere else and be out of people and... He prayed about it. And you know what he said? I'm going to leave this ministry and go and translate Bible. For 15 years, he left everything, went to the wilderness. With the prayer and power of God, he translated the first Latin Vulgate Bible, which paved the way for translation of many other Bibles. He decided, that's my calling. That's the purpose. He would have been the pastor of the church, enjoyed all the luxuries and the fame and name, but he decided, I'm going there to do something more dear to my heart. And then he did 15 years of that work, and today we have Bibles in many translations based on his work. Sometimes another pastor said, I have to quit ministry to do ministry. Get this statement. I have to quit ministry to do ministry. Sometimes we are so caught up with the system and the way of doing things, we are actually imprisoned ourselves in this system and we are not fulfilling the purpose for which God has created us. Just because I'm preaching doesn't mean that's what God has called me to do. God has put in each one of us a potential that we have to discover. And if, even if it is God's work that's a hindrance, quit it to fulfill the purpose for which God has created you. Jerome did that, and as a result, we have Bible. Have you heard of John Wesley? Do you have a Methodist church in this country? Yeah? He's the founder of Methodist church. Again, a Britisher. When he was studying in Oxford, training to be a pastor, one day he went to buy, his room was not decorated. So he went to the shop, bought some paintings so that he could decorate his room. While he was coming, it was a winter, it was a winter evening. As he was walking on the corridor, he met a chambermaid, a lady, oh, cleaning the rooms, and she had a very thin clothing, and it was a winter evening. Here is Wesley with a nice coat and warm cloth, uh, warm coat, and here is a chambermaid who is having a very thin coat, almost shivering but cleaning. He looked at her, and he felt sorry for her. He put his hands in his pocket to think, See if he has got some money to give to her so that she could go and buy some coat only to realize there's only a few pennies left in his pocket which may not even help her to get the coat that she needed. So he didn't know what to do. He went into his room and uh, he was putting in his, all his paintings but the picture of that lady who is cleaning the rooms with a very thin clothing and shivering haunted him and this is what he says. When he was, that night, this is what he heard. This is what he felt his conscience telling him. Will thy master say, well done, thou good and faithful steward. Thou hast adorned thy walls with the money that might have screened this poor creature from the cold. O oh, justice, O oh, mercy, are not these pictures the blood of this poor maid? He felt so sorry that he is adorning his room with pictures when there is a fellow human being who doesn't even have a coat to wear in the winter. Can we even think like that? 
Some of us don't even care what the other person is all about. We don't even allow some poor people to come near to us. But this man's conscience pricked him so much. So what he decided was, <clears throat> when, he, when he finished his studies in 1731, he began to, when he, be, when he started earning, his salary was 30 pounds a year. Those days, 30 pounds a year. He said, I'm going to budget my money. When he budgeted everything, how he would spend his money, it came to 28 pounds, which means he could save two pounds a year. Then he decided he's going to give those two pounds to the poor and the needy. Then the next day when his salary increased to whatever it was, he still survived on 28 pounds and gave the rest for the poor. There was a time when his salary came to 120 pounds and he still survived on 28 pounds and gave the rest to the poor. And this is the famous statement. This is what he says. Money never stays with me. It would burn me if it did. I throw it out of my hands as soon as possible, lest it should find its way into my heart. Honestly, how I wish I could say that statement. How I wish I'm committed to making that statement in my own life. Someone said, if you want to make somebody tell a lie, there's an easy way. Even if he's a pastor or a prophet or whoever, if you want them to tell a lie, there is an easy way. You know what it is? Ask them how much money they have. Very seldom anybody will tell the truth. Ask them how much money you have. Most of the time, oh, I have some, but I, I don't have enough. Nobody will tell you exactly how much money they have. Somehow, money and us have been attached. This man says he just can't keep it, otherwise it would burn his hands. One incident changed his entire perception of how he wanted to live. And that's what he lived. And then when he died, <clears throat> all that was found in his possession was few pennies of coins, all his entire earning of 30 years, he gave it away, amounted to 160,000 pounds. And all his 30 years of ministry, he only spent around 20,000 pounds on his life. And the rest, he gave it away. And yet, the whole world knows him. The amount of things he did around the world. The Methodist church is a worldwide church. Come to England and see these massive, massive buildings of Methodism. Because he dedicated himself to say, not only do I preach, but I believe and practice what I preach. The two great commandments, love your God and love your fellow men. That's the purpose of our life. If that too are we are not doing, we are a wasted creation. God has wasted a creation in you and in me. And then this is another statement based on, he says, when God blesses you financially, don't raise your standard of living, raise your standard of giving. When God blesses us financially, oh, a two-bedroom house, it's too small, let me build a four-bedroom house. This car is too old, let me buy a better car. Let me buy another property here. Let me send my, my children to a nice, ho nice uh, uh, holiday, whatever. I'm not saying they're bad, but if you are a Christian committed to the Lord, it's not the standard of life that should go, standard of giving, because that's the purpose for which God has put money in our hands, so that we could bless somebody else. There's a story about this man was watching TV, all the tragedies that's happening in the world, a Christian, he felt so sorry. He said he raised up, he lifted his hands up to the Lord and said, Lord, when will you send help and save these people? My heart is bleeding to see them suffer. And he got an answer in a dream. I have sent you, what are you doing? We are willing to pray for all this poor and the needy, but what are you doing? Let me tell you, helping hands are more powerful than praying hands. If you could help even a dollar, don't pray. First help, then start thinking of praying. Your prayer has no power when you have the power to help. Let us not misuse prayer and feel comfortable that I've prayed for the poor and the needy. When your hands can do something about it. Because on this earth, you are God's hands and I'm God's hands. God is not going to open the heaven and pour out money onto poor people. He has chosen you and he has chosen me. There are around 2.3 billion Christians on this earth. 
There are over billion poor people who are not having food. If every Christian decides to give a one dollar a month, one dollar a month, we could elevate poverty on this earth. You don't have to sacrifice your houses and lands. We are all willing to pray, but not willing to support. Lord, have mercy on us. That's what he did. This is a lady called Sindhutai Sapkal. This is an Indian lady. <clears throat> this lady, when she was, she was born in a poor family in Pune. You know, Pune is a Spicer College, have you heard? That's where I studied, that's where your VC also studied. She was born near to a small town there. Uh, and uh, very poor family. She, her parents could not even send her to school. And they, she used to take care of cows. And at the age of 10, she, was, she got married those days. At the age of 10, she got married to a man who was 30 years old. Those days, child marriages in India were very common. And then by the age of 20, she bore three boys and she was pregnant with the fourth child, which happened to be a girl. And she saw so much of in this. This is the work she used to do. Daytime, she would go take care of the cows. Evening, she would come and, you know, cow dung? She would, and then in India, they used to take, collect this cow dung and then paste it onto the walls so that it would dry and that was used as a firewood to cook those days because even they couldn't get the firewood. So that was used to cook. You can burn it, use it as a fire, and you cook. So that's what. So when she used to dry her cow dung on the wall so that it would be dry to be used to cook, in the night, some thieves would come and steal it and go. She went to the village chief and she complained. And the village chief said, do you know who it is stealing? And they said, yeah, these men, these men, these men. And uh, the village chief reprimanded them. And those men were angry with her. How dare you complain about us? They came home and told the husband, next time if your wife causes any trouble, we are going to kill you. The husband got scared and he told the wife, get out of my home. She was nine months pregnant, fourth child. Husband said, you're causing trouble to me, get out of my home. She said, why? This is for our family I'm doing. But said, it doesn't care. And he literally sent her away heavily pregnant. She went to her mother's home saying that the husband kicked her out of the home. And the mother said, you don't belong here, go back to your husband. In those days, the culture was, once you're married, your husband is in charge. Whether he beats you, kills you, that's not our problem, you go back. Very, very strange mindset. She, her own parents won't, didn't want to take her. So she went back, husband closed the door, he didn't want to, and she's now having labor pains. And attached to her home was a cow shed where the cows were there. That's where that night she gave birth to her child, all by herself. Nobody to do. She thought, I would commit suicide. What's the point of living? So she took the child in her arms and went somewhere to the railway station, thinking that she will put her head on the tracks and he, she and her little baby would die. When she went there, she saw this tiny baby in her hands crying and a mother's heart, she didn't want to die. So instead of falling on the tracks and dying, she sat on the street, uh, on the railway platform and she started begging for food. Parents didn't want her, husband didn't want her. She has no education, no job. So she would go, when the train comes, she would beg for food so that she could feed herself and breastfeed her child. And when the evening came, she would go nearby, somewhere on the right sideways, and sleep on the floor there. 20-year-old lady with a little baby. One day while she was begging, got some food, sat by the road, sat by there, and then what happens? So many boys and girls came, sat next to her while she was eating the food that she begged. Looking at all of them, she felt so sorry for them. So whatever the little bit things she begged, she gave them each. And there was joy, there was happiness in their faces that they were able to eat some food. Her heart bleeded, how can this be? So she started begging more rigorously so that she could get more food. And then when she sat to eat, more kids would come and she would feed all of them along with her child. 
And when the evening came, they all would sleep together on a railway platform. The police would come in the afternoon. This is not the place. They would beat them and send them away. So next to the railway station was an abandoned building. She would go and sleep. She was a very beautiful young woman. And the evening, some crooks, some men would come because they want to sleep with her, to rape her. She faced so many problems with a child and these men like vultures all around. And close to the railway station was a graveyard. She decided she would go and sleep in the graveyard. She would take her little child and these little children that were around her and go sleep in the graveyard. And she says no man had courage to come to the graveyard to rape her. She found the safest place on earth was a graveyard. How cruel some men could be. And then 20 kids, 30 kids. When she is walking on the railway platform begging, all these kids were around. Orphans who have nobody to take care, begging on the streets. She decided, I will be their mother. She would beg all day, and whatever she would get, she would feed all of them. Somebody felt pity for her and said, you know what, there's an abandoned building opposite to this railway station. You could use that place to sleep and keep these children. So that's what she would do. And later somebody helped her to get some money from somebody so that she could renovate that building. And somebody else later came to help her to establish a small charity and you know, said, you can ask people for donation, you're doing a great work. She had all these children. She educated 1,050 of them. They became some of them doctors, engineers, got them married. And uh, I don't know, do you watch Bollywood movies? Yeah? If you haven't watched, then you haven't lived on this earth yet, yeah? You know, um, these are great Bollywood heroes, world famous, Amitabh Bachchan and other people. They all went to honor her for, the perp for, the, for what she has done for the society. She begged on the roads, educated 1,400 children. She became a legend. She said, I am a mother to those who don't have parents. What is, I'm, I am there for all those who have no one. Last year only she passed away. In fact, I forgot to tell you, when she was caring for all these children on the railway station, she was torn between the love for her own child and these children. You know what she did? She gave her child for adoption. She said, I don't want the love for my own child to be an interruption to the love for these kids. So she gave her own child for an adoption so that she could concentrate on taking care of these children and educated 1,400, a beggar woman. A beggar woman. She recognized the purpose of her life at the railway station begging for food when she saw children around. People with millions of dollars and pounds don't even have a heart. But a beggar can educate 1,400 children. No education, nothing. She traveled all around the world. If you see her trophies that she got, honors, around the world she traveled. Hundreds and hundreds of honorary degrees. Yet she didn't know how to read and write properly. Narayan Krishnan, he's another person from where I come from, uh, from where my wife comes from. He, he was a great chef, highly educated, working in Taj hotels. Taj hotels in India are some of the famous five-star, seven-star hotels. Very lucrative job and high-paid job. And because of his skills as a young man, a big chef, he, he was given a post to go to Switzerland to work in one of the seven-star hotels. So he went to apply for a visa. While he was waiting for visa, one day he was walking on the streets of his town and there he saw beggars begging. And he, with all his suit and money and fame he was wanting to, he looked at them and this is what he thought. I'm a human being. He's a human being. Both are men. I am in this position. He is there, begging just for a meal, little bit of food. What is the purpose of my life? Go to Switzerland, earn more money, buy a bigger house. What, what is it going to do? I don't know what impressed him. By the way, they're Hindus, they're not Christians. The previous woman also was a Hindu. He's a Hindu, not Christians. Some of the most loving and lovable people that I met in my life are not Christians. Non-Christians. Even atheists, such a good heart they have. If a Christian helps, oh, I helped. Now the Lord Jesus will help me. We are such a selfish bunch of people. We do because we want God to bless us. 
Then he decided, you know what, I don't want to go. Whatever the little I'll have, I will take care of these poor people here. Young man, not married, full of potential and a future and a hope, but he decided he would do it. And then he, in his own home, because he was a chef, he started buying things and cut vegetables, cook food, and he would go on the streets, collect these beggars who are stinking and smelling, bring them to some place, make them sit, and he would feed them. Can you imagine putting your arm around a man who is stinking and smelling? Sit with him and feed? Suddenly he got a thought, I will start a charity. So he opened a charity. Whoever wants to help, he would put some pictures of what he's doing. If you're willing to help, help. And then people would give some donations, whatever they could. And whatever he got, he would buy the food, he would cook himself, and every day he was feeding 430 people breakfast, lunch, and supper in his city. He would cook, take the food everywhere. And he said, you know what? I was working in a seven-star hotel with nice dress and tips and good money. I never was satisfied. Now when I take, go on the streets and sit with these unfortunate people, with my own hand I feed it. There is joy that no million dollars can give me. They can't even bathe. He would bathe them. He would shave. He would take care of them. He's still there. He got an award as a CNN hero. People recognized this is life, a human being helping some other human being to have a decent life. That is the purpose of our life. This girl, Maggie Doyne, is an American girl. She finished her A-levels, do you call here? I don't know what you call after a GCSE. It's like before you go to the university. She finished her courses and then she wanted to take a gap year. You know gap year? You just want to have a break, then you continue your studies. So she told her parents, she told her parents, I want to go to India and just spend some time helping some charity. The parents said, yeah, you can go. So she went to Delhi, which is a capital city. There's an orphanage there. <clears throat> she was helping that orphanage, just helping in teaching and singing and whatever it could. She was 18 years old and uh, there were some students from Nepal. So they went for holidays. There was one girl, one girl that she was so closely affiliated with. So that girl did not come back. And she was a bit concerned. What happened to this little girl? She didn't come back. The orphanage director said, we don't know. She said, can I go to Nepal and find out if what she's... They said, sure. So this 18-year-old college student taking a gap year just to have some free time, she traveled from India to Nepal trying to find this girl. And she found this girl carrying heavy load of stuff and going home. Why didn't you come back to school? I have to take care of my parents. I have to work, there's nobody to take care. Nine-year-old girl. No, you have to study, otherwise your life will be, no, I can't study. Who will take care of my parents? This lady's 18-year-old girl, student, heart was bleeding, how can this be? When she saw the statistics of how many poor children she recognized around the world, there are 80 million people who are in this condition. What can she do? She has nothing. But there was a love that she developed for this. She said to that girl, I'll help a little bit to your parents. Go back to school. She took and they put that girl in the local school so that she can be close to that. She said to the school, I'll pay the fees. And then her heart developed. I must do something. What can I do? So she rang to the parents in America and said, Mom and Dad, do you know how much money I have in my bank? And the mom and dad said, you have $5,000. All that, that she was saving up by helping, by doing the chores at home. The parents gave her some money. She saved her own money when she did some part-time job. All that she saved was $5,000. The parents said, you have $5,000 in your account. She said, Dad, can you send that money to me? Why? There are so many poor people here. I want to help. But baby, you need that money for your education. I don't care. Send my money. That's my money. All right, we'll send that money. They sent that $5,000. With $1,000, she bought a small little place. And with another 1000 or so, she built a small room around. And she started taking little children, feeding them, putting them in local school. She put all the pictures in the Facebook, sent to all her friends in America. I'm doing this. I don't know whether my, what my future holds. I don't know whether, whether I will even go to the college or not. But I find great joy in seeing the smile on these unfortunate kids. If you want to help, please help. And all her friends sent the pictures to their friends. It spread like a wildfire. She started a small charity. Donations kept coming. 
She bought two acres of land. She built a beautiful place. These are some of the children she was educating. She built this huge place where 200 orphans are being educated. An 18-year-old girl became a mother to all these children. And the donations kept coming. At 23, as she, that many children she was raising. She became as the hero of, in 2015. And not only that, later she also opened some charity, other things. She is now having a school to educate 400 children and another school to educate 200 children. A college girl taking a gap year, finding the purpose and meaning of her life. Another story, this is in Liberia, a girl called Alice or Alice. You know, she grew up in a poor home and she was a very happy, bubbly child. What happened when she was training to be a nurse? She was training to be a midwife. She was in year, second year of nursing. And she came for holidays to him. You know, Liberia is a very war-torn country. So that time there was a war and nobody could go out of home. And people medically, it is a deprived country. And the street where she was living, there was police all around. Nobody was allowed to come. There was this pregnant woman, heavily pregnant labor pains. She was trying to walk towards the neighbor to the nearby um, clinic. As she was walking, the police stopped her and they beat her. And she was on the ground crying. Labor pain and police beating. What could she do? Very close to her house. This Alice opened the window and looked at her. Her heart was bleeding. And she said, I want to go and help. The father said, don't go. Otherwise, they'll kill you too. And the cry of this woman who was pregnant was so severe, the policeman put the gun on her head and said, if you don't stop crying, I'm going to shoot you. How can she stop crying when the pain is so high? Men, we don't understand the pain of pregnancy or labor. And then suddenly the soldier shouted, is there anyone who wants to come and help this girl? Otherwise, I'm going to shoot her. Alice heard it from inside. Parents are saying, don't go, otherwise you'll kill. No, I'm training to be a nurse. How can I see somebody suffer and don't help? I don't care. If they kill me, let them kill me. I'm going to help. The father held her and said, no, I'm not sending you. She pushed her father, opened the door, ran to the woman. And the soldier saw her coming and said, you want to help her? I said, yes, sir, I want to help. If something goes wrong, I'm going to shoot both of you. And the baby is coming out. What can she do? There's no equipment, nothing. The little knowledge she had as being a second year nursing student, she started whatever she could and she needed something to cut the umbilical cord. There was a beer bottle nearby. She took the bottle, she cut it with that thing. She cut the umbilical cord and tied it up and saved the mother and the baby. And that's when she said, I've discovered the purpose of my life. She was dreaming of doing nursing, going to America, going to United Kingdom, become a nurse and earn money. But she said, no, I will stay here and help as many as people possible have a safe delivery. I will save, serve my people. She started, finished her nursing. She would work there. And, you know, she delivered over thousand, more than so many thousands of children. And all those children were named Alice on her name. If it is girl, Alice. If it is boy, Alex. Parents were so happy. She would go from place to place. A pregnant woman would travel eight miles or eight hours to the nearby clinic. So many kids die in Liberia. But she decided, you know, have you heard of Ebola crisis? 5,000 people died. Nobody dared to go because it was such a thing. They were given this space, uh, a suit to cover. This girl lady took it and she would walk from street to street. Her own family abandoned her. She said, don't come back. But she went from house to house to look for pregnant women and serve them, even during that Ebola crisis, when nobody was wanting to come. Every clinic was closed. Everybody were there. She would go on a bike. She was so scared. She was so worried why this pregnant woman have to walk eight hours. She said, I will go to their homes. So she would hire a man and pay his petrol, and she would go from village to village saying, is there a pregnant woman? I'm here to come to help you. And she would deliver babies safely. She became like a god for all of them just because she discovered the purpose of her life is to save some children who are dying. Final story I will share and close. This boy is called Ryan. He's from Canada. He was six years old. In his, class, in his school, they were raising funds 
for Uganda to some water project. Water can they call it? There's so many people suffering without water. And so they were raising money. So this boy comes home and says, Mom and Dad, can you give me some money? I have to send to the school because they're raising money to, uh, for drinking water, safe drinking water in Uganda and Tanzania and some places. The parents gave him some money. So he came to this, then he came to the school and he was trying to give that money. And the people said, please go dig one well, dig some bore well. And they said, boy, this doesn't help. So he goes back to the parents and they give me some more money. The parents said, no, we're not giving. You clean your bed, you clean your things, we will give you some money. So he was trying to do his own chores. Parents gave him a dollar, a two dollar, whatever, up to that. In three months, he raised $70. He went with the $70 to the school, a six-year-old boy. And uh, they said, you, there's, there's a water can foundation. You go there and give them. When he went to there, they said, boy, it takes $2,000 to build a well or a bore well. Boy was so sad, he came back, he told the parents, the parents said, continue to do your work and maybe go to your neighbor's home and ask them for donations. By, the, by now he's eight years old. As he was collecting, it took him two years to raise the money, $2,000. And he went to this water can foundation and said, here is the money, go dig the well. So with that boy's donations, they dug uh, uh, in a school in Uganda, they, they put this water facility where children can have good drinking water. And when one of his neighbor who was a rich man saw this little boy's passion to go from house to house, knock at the door and say, I'm raising money for drinking water in Uganda, can you help me? This, boy, this man was taken up. And when he realized that he raised, he rose $2,000 and dug a, or some water facility there, he said to that man, boy, nine-year-old boy, boy, you want to go to Uganda and see the school where your, your donation has uh, bought that water, water facility? He said, yeah, I will sponsor you a ticket. You can go. So he gave him money for a ticket. And this boy, at the age of 11 or so, he comes to Uganda to see the school where the little money that he raised was providing good drinking water. At the age of 11, his heart was touched. What's the point? I, in Canada, I have everything. And look at these boys and girls. They're even struggling for drinking water. And he decided he would start a charity of his own and raise more money. So he went back as a teenager he started a charity called Ryan Foundation and he started raising money and providing water facilities all over Uganda, Tanzania and other places because he realized people there are struggling even to get proper drinking water. He started, you know, nine, 900 projects he put in these countries which benefited one million people with clean drinking water. 900 projects, 1 million people benefited. A young boy gave up his school, but he's a world famous man now because he started living for somebody else. The purpose of our life is not to live for self. That is a wasted creation, but to love God and love fellow. If every Christian could come up with something to live to something there. So he, he, he has done so much. Imagine these pictures. In this country, I'm not sure you have sick people, people with a turban, Indians. I don't know if you have seen them. In, in Britain, this is a, they have a religion called, uh, they do charity work so much. During this crisis of, uh, what is the recent one? We have COVID-19, churches were shut, everybody are shut, we're all trying to save ourselves. These people open their Gurudwar, we call it, their temple, for people to come and to be fed. You know, they, they feed so many people day and night. All professionals, rich people, morning they would go, if the, if the office is at seven o'clock, five o'clock they would go to that place. Help in cooking, cutting vegetables, and doing everything. Doctors, engineers, all professionals, they would give a helping hand because for the rest of the day, they want to pour this peep, feed these people who are not there, who, who are struggling for food. And in fact, you look at what the uh, newspaper, British newspaper says about them. Today, thousands of free langer meals are served every day in Sikh temple throughout the UK. The Guru Singh uh, have 5,000 meals on weekdays, 10,000 meals on weekend. Just in one place. Look at our Christians. We give $2 and we boast like as though we saved the whole world. All professionals.
they serve the humanity not expecting anything in back we have we will help they are all engineers doctors feeding when they come back from work before they go home they go and help in cooking then they go home what about us we come to late church we go to work late and we are comfortable and in the evening we pray lord thank you for saving my life that is our identity and religion you know which is the richest place on earth graveyard many of us go there never discovered for what you have been created never allowed the potential for which god has given you to be used for his glory that's where will be this why am i here ask yourself i told you stories of people who are not rich who are not famous and yet started living for the purpose for which they have been created god invested everything for you in his son jesus what have you invested you don't need money you don't need education you don't need to be fame just a willing heart to live for which god has created you start praying about it if god can do all this through beggars little boys and girls a teenage girl god can do it through you and me god bless you